you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Visual decision making is often studied within a discrimination task. Let's assume a monkey or a human that has to perceive a grading stimulus and has to make a decision about it. We know that monkeys perform such a task um, accurately and flexibly, and we want to know how is this possible? How does it do that? So first of all, information needs to be encoded. There are cells that vary their response with respect to different stimulus orientations. A common way to model this encoding process is with a stimulus response function and a stochastic process that is supposed to, cap um, to capture trial-to-trial -trial fluctuations. So given such a population of stochastic orientation-tuned cells and two different stimuli that have to, have to be differentiated, only a few cells will actually be informative by changing their response as the stimulus changes. Presumably, this would be what the monkey will base its decision on. Now, while encoding is well studied, we know relatively little about how accurate and flexible decoding is achieved by a population um, of cells to allow for this behavioral performance that we see. One traditional approach is to formulate an optimal decoder. Optimality hereby can be reached in two different ways. First, one can use the probabilistic encoding model that I described here to formulate a statistically optimal decoder. So that could be a maximum likelihood or a Bayesian approach. In our model here, the maximum likelihood decoding weights turn out to be a linear weighted sum of the responses. Because of that, the same optimal decoding weights could be learned with a simple linear regression. However, while both of those approaches achieve accuracy, they are not necessarily biologically plausible. So maximum likelihood would assume to know this complete encoding model here, the probabilistic encoding model, and the tuning function of each one of those neurons. Now it seems impossible that a decoding population will have this knowledge. Now while regression does not require us to know this from the beginning, it does need a lot of trials to figure out what the optimal decoding weights would be. And we know that the monkey can perform such a trial very flexibly and learn fast what to do. So it's not clear that this would be a reasonable approach either. So this leaves us with a general mystery of how accurate and flexible decoding can be achieved in a biologically plausible way. We propose a solution to this based on the following experimental results. Um, studies found that the trial to trial variance of neurons given the same stimulus exceeds the expected variance from a simple independent Poisson process. These additional fluctuations are mostly low dimensional and multiplicative. This suggests that there is something of a shared modulation that varies the response of the neurons from trial to trial. Now in experiments by Cohen and Mansell, where V4 populations were recorded in a discrimination task, a follow-up analysis on this data by Robinovitz et al. fit such a shared modulation and actually found that the strength of the modulator varied across neurons, so it's not the same for each neuron. How much a neuron was affected by the modulation correlated with how informative the neuron was for a sp specific task. This figure here from Rabinovitz et al. shows exactly that. The more the neuron helped us to differentiate between two stimuli, the stronger it was affected by the modulation. Opposed differently, the shared modulation seems to target task informative neurons. Now this is important because it seems counterintuitive. It basically means that we inject more noise to those neurons that are informative, that help us solve the task. However, it could also be seen as a labeling mechanism. The shared modulation labels the informative cells. So while this happens, of course, in the encoding population and leaves a lot of open question of where this modulation is coming from or why it has this information, now we'll come back to that in the end, we want to focus on decoding and we want to know whether this modulation labeling can be used for decoding. Specifically, we propose that this stochastic noise-inducing modulation could guide a naive decoder towards the informative cells. So here we propose an alternative to the general optimal decoders that I described before. We um, specifically formulated a heuristic modulation-based decoder that does not know any of this encoding population, but it does know the shared modulation. Um, now it will compare the neurons' responses and the modulation um, to set the decoding weights accordingly. Specifically, 
it will set the decoding weights proportional to the inner product of the response and the modulation. Since it will be necessary to differentiate to stimuli, a second step is to learn the signs, so whether a known increases or decreases the firing um, with a specific stimulus. Um, the learning of the signs has to happen at a trial by trial rate because we have to wait for the stimulus to change. We need this comparison. However, there are two plausible ways of learning for the absolute weights. Um, either they are also learned across the trials or if the modulator fluctuates also within trials, they could be learned already within a trial. We will consider these two possibilities later when we compare the decoder performances. Finally, we want to test whether the knowledge of the modulation is even necessary. An even simpler approach would be to simply um, assign high readout weights to those neurons which are um, strongly active. Um, this would not require any knowledge about the modulation. We just have to see the responses and then say, okay, those neurons are very active. We're going to listen to those. Um, it could work because neurons that are informative will necessarily have to increase their activity at some point. Um, and neurons that have response functions that are completely out of the range will have low activity. However, it might be problematic for a neuron like this, which responds a lot to both stimuli, and will therefore get a high um, readout weight. Now we will compare such a rate-based decoder um, that takes the readout weights proportional to the mean response rate. Now this leaves us with three decoders. The optimal decoder, which could be maximum likelihood or regression, the modulation-based decoder, and the rate-based decoder. Um, each one of them is a linear weighted sum of the responses. However, they differ with respect to their biological possibility because they make different assumptions about what the decoding population of cells needs to know about the encoding population. So now we will simulate um, responses from, the, from such an encoding model, so such a modulated Poisson model, and then test the different decoders with respect to the accuracy and the flexibility or learning efficiency. So first, to the accuracy. So simulating a small set of informative neurons in a population and the low modulation variance, so little noise, an optimal linear decoder will perform fairly well and give us something of a um, lower bound on the error rate. In comparison, a simple rate-based decoder performs pretty poorly. It's almost a chance level. If we add this information from the um, modulation and use this heuristic modulation-based decoder, the error rate um, decreases with respect to the rate-based decoder, but it's also nowhere close to optimal. It's somewhere in the middle. Now, as we increase the modulation variance, thereby increasing the noise in our simulations, um, both the optimal decoder and the rate-based decoder will increase the error rate, which is um, intuitive because we increase the noise. Um, however, the modulation-based decoder will initially decrease its error rate. So it starts out somewhere close to the rate-based decoder, and it, as we increase the modulation variance a little bit, it will drop quickly the error rate and get somewhere close to the optimal decoder. This is because increasing the variance will make it easier for this modulation-based decoder to figure out which neurons um, are informative. <clears throat> However, as we further increase the modulation variance, we will, of course, still um, increase the noise of the informative neurons, make them less reliable, and therefore the um, modulation-based decoder error rate will also um, increase, finally. Um, so this suggests that there is an ideal amount of modulation variance for such a um, decoding mechanism. We do not yet have a quantitative analysis of how this matches experimental results, but our model parameters are similar to those fit by Rabinowitz et al. to data, so we believe them to be um, plausible. Now the next step is the learning efficiency the flexibility to switch between a specific task scenario. It's basically, um, now we ask the question, how quickly can the error rate uh, be, be decreased with increasing the number of trials that we learn from? So simulating a population again, where only a few cells are informative, it will take a simple linear regression a long time to um, get to this optimal um, decoding weights. So the error rate only drops very slowly. If we now zoom in to a more realistic number of trials and compare to the learning rate of the modulation-based decoder, we see that even such a heuristic decoder can learn more quickly than regression. Specifically, if we assume that the absolute weights 
can be learned already within trials, which is this lower curve here. We see that the error rate um, drops quite strongly already after a few trials compared to regression. However, it still takes this heuristic decoder quite a long time to reach its asymptotic performance. So one of the next steps will be to explore how regression and um, anti-modulation information can be combined to achieve faster learning rates that allow for the behavior that we see. So to conclude this, shared variability seems to facilitate or could facilitate biological plausible decoding as we show here. We propose a modulation-based decoder that could achieve near optimal performance given a specific modulation variance. In future steps, we want to see um, how, the depend how the decoder performance depends on the specific tuning properties um, in a population. So how many neurons are informative, for instance. Further, um, this targeted modulation was found in one specific experimental setting, and we want to see if there's further evidence for this mechanism, whether it could be a general phenomenon. And finally, um, there is still the question of what is the origin of this modulation signal. Um, we do not exactly know where it's coming from, but one possibility would be specifically for the experiments by Cohen and Monsell, that the uh, modulation is placed locally at a stage like V1, where informative cells are indeed spatially localized because of the topographic map. And then the modulation could propagate together with the signal to an area like V4, where the cells are no longer spatially localized, but they would still be labeled by this modulation. And finally, I want to um, thank the lab for all the support both with the work and with this talk. And I want to thank Neil Rabinovitz for sharing his analysis and finally the funding sources that make this work possible. Thank you. Questions? Could you consider the possibility that uh, in a spike timing model, uh, close in, a, spikes, sorry, in, a, in a spike timing model, mm -hmm. close spike time synchrony represents uh, a way uh, to do a decoder? Um, Based on your modulation, if you're going to have a common modulation, presumably you're going to have much higher correlation in terms of exact spike timing yeah. between the cells which can be needed. So you could have an even more realistic model for the decoder, yes. which is going to be based on close spike time synchrony. Yeah, definitely. So we haven't um, explored the, the mechanistic side of this yet. So this is a very general model that just says that it would be possible, but um, it would definitely be interesting to look how it would actually be implemented in neurons and, yeah. Hi, so great talk. I'm curious what percent of the weights were informative and um, do you think if you had like a sparsity penalty on the regressor regression method that you would be able to learn it more quickly? Um, so for the learning rate, I actually used um, rich regression. So um, it, there, was, there was some constraint. And um, in the population that I simulated here, there were about 5% informative cells. So um, as I pointed out in the future directions, it does like the, the performance of course depends on um, how many informative cells there are in a population. So um, yeah, it will be important to, to take that into consideration. Yeah. Is it fair to say that you um, replaced the problem um, for the decoder to learn which are the most informative neurons by the modulator? now having to learn what the most informative neurons are? And so why do you think that would be easier for the modulator? So yeah, so definitely um, you, you point out correctly that there's still this big question of where does the modulation have this information um, in the first place? We, as I said, we do not know that exactly. We just know that we can extract it from the data. And this is kind of the, the starting point that we took. But yeah, it will definitely be important to, to um, think of how this modulation comes about and why it has this labeling function. Okay, that, uh, that concludes our, uh, oh, question. Oh, we have, uh, that concludes our talk sessions where we have an announcement. Let's thank the speaker.